Hello and welcome to another episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. We are very lucky today to be joined by Richard Pennington. Richard, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay. Well, thanks for inviting me, guys. Um, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon with a uh, uh, subspecialty training and interest in the upper limb, so from the shoulder to the, to the hand. Um, I work in Melbourne in both public and private sector. I've been in Melbourne for just five to six years, having been in Australia for about 10 years. So I did my um, core sort of registrar training in the UK, and then I came to Australia to do the subspecialty fellowships, and then for various reasons ended up ended up staying so it's interesting you say that because i've heard of people doing the opposite you know some melbourne or australian based surgeons going over to the uk because you know obviously the network is bigger and mm-hmm. there are different experiences to get there what was the driver for you to come here and do your subspecialty um it's uh it's it's an in- interesting take on that because most um there's there's uh, some sort of kudos to an overseas fellowship yes, it seems that way so um it, uh, and it's it's whether you're going from the UK to Australia or Australia to the UK. There's still the sort of uh, it's it's good to have an international fellowship on your on your CV. So uh, for me coming to Australia, I'd been here before backpacking many many years ago and had a great time here and uh, thought it'd be a good good uh, opportunity to spend some time here again with with the family. Uh, my wife's Australian, so. Um, uh, that was one of the drivers as well. And Makes it easier. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> so. Do you see some differences between um, how, say, assessing and treating the shoulder or the upper limb through different surgeries different to Australia than, say, the UK? Do you see some differences or is there a lot of similarity? Um, I think I think the treatments are pretty similar. Obviously, it's mm-hmm. 10 years now since I worked, worked mm-hmm. in the UK. Um, <clears throat> I think overall... Uh, UK medicine, certainly UK surgical practice, is is probably on the more conservative side in terms of uh, offering treatment and trial of non-operative treatment before uh, before intervening with surgery. Um, and the and the the other big difference is the number of uh, cases that stay overnight in hospital here, which are all done as day cases in the UK. So generally, rotator cuff repairs. Um, Keep going. ACLs, um, that sort of thing, which are all day cases in the UK and mm. our, uh, our overnight stays here. So part of the thing I've been doing at um, certainly Northern Health and Eastern Health, is, to, which is where all my public appointments are, is to try and um, try and bring that day case uh, surgery in because obviously there's cost savings. Yeah, of course. You're less likely to, if you, if you don't require a bed, then you're not going to get your operation cancelled because there's no bed available on yeah, the day. Okay. So it has got a secondary effect. So Do surgeons not like doing sur- getting up early in the morning and doing surgery? <laughs> 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 Is that why you have, the night, you have to have that stay over the night? Um, no, I, th- I, I think it's partly patient-driven, I think, over okay. here as well. I think um, there's a bit more private work over here than there is in the... Well, a lot more private work here than there is mm. in the UK. And so yep. uh, I think if people are uh, uh, paying their health insurance uh, and they think they don't want to be rushed out of hospital, they want to sure. stay overnight. And mm. so, But in terms of the actual mechanics of how we treat, no, mm. I don't think there's any major, major differences. And for you, why upper limb? Um, from personal uh, issues and injuries, actually. So I, um, from my, so my first surgical attachment was actually vascular surgery when I was a medical student. It was about year three. So I thought, oh, this is this is pretty cool. I'd like, like to be a surgeon. I didn't know what then. And you, and you your basic surgical training be, uh, is slightly different in the UK to here. So you do six months um, in a special so I did six months of orthopedics, plastics, neurosurgery, general surgery. So... Um, and in the meantime, I, I dislocated my shoulder quite a lot playing playing rugby, and yeah. so um, as also, you do, yeah. <laughs> so it's a, a, a common common mechanism. So, so then uh, having had ironically shoulder surgery in the UK by an Australian surgeon, um, did you have a, how did what surgery did you have? I said no. So this was uh, this was my final year as a medical student. So um, it was just when arthroscopic surgery was coming. So I actually had an open open stabilisation of my... Yeah, no, I've had, I've had a stabilisation as well. It was a bit later, obviously, than you, and it was arthroscopic. But um, it brings me to the interesting, 
I mean, let's, let's dive down there because I think with shoulder stabilization, obviously the interesting surgery to me, obviously, is the, the ladder J. Yes. Um, and speaking with a couple of upper limb surgeons, you know, I think it's something that obviously takes some time to develop the skills for that. Yep. Um, do you think that given the proximity to where it was you know, developed in, in France, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, are British surgeons typically a little bit more on top of that surgery or is it something that now worldwide is pretty pretty common? I think, I think it's pretty common yep. world, worldwide now. I think it's uh, a well-accepted procedure. Um, and I think the issue is if, you're, if you've made the decision you're going to do a, a bony procedure yeah. to, for... Uh, the discussion now really is whether you go for a latage or whether you just go for a bone, a bone graft, bone block, for yeah. iliac crest bone graft. And um, what's what's the differentiation in your mind about why you would go for one or the other? Um, for so in in sort of simple terms, so you've got you've got the bony block with with both. With yes. The advantages of the latage is because you've got the tendon attachments from you've the chondro yep. tendon. Your yep you're getting... Um, like a secondary restraint. Correct. So you get a sling as you put the arm into abduction and external rotation. So, um, and there is a small proportion of them where the bone actually uh, resorbs or dissolves. Yep. So you look take CT scans uh, six, 12 months later, there's minimal bone left, but the shoulder is still stable and functioning well. So therefore, it's got to be the sling effect of the... So you worry in doing just a bone block on its own, whether that would occur. The mm. advantage of a bone block is you can still do, if it fails, you can still do a latage as a uh, revision procedure. If you do a latage, then trying to revise that technically is very demanding. Um, the complication rate is much higher because you've changed the anatomy, so you've lost all your landmarks, your surgical landmarks, when you're going into the into the shoulder. So in terms of, of planning, I discussed with the patient, if they're doing a sport where they're, if they've got a bone, they've got a bony defect, and we're thinking we need to do a bony procedure. Well, well, sorry to interrupt you. There. Like right. for our listeners, I think one of the discussions I had with one of the surgeons was, you know, like they always think about, uh, or they particularly look at the imaging and they look at how much loss they've actually had to that that sure. bony structure. Do you have like a, a percentage that you work off that you think is a, you know, I'm happy with this. I'm happy to not necessarily do these bony. Um, those bony blocks or know that this is the amount of bone loss that I think or coverage that I've got and I need to then do one of these different procedures? Yeah, I think an, an absolute in my, my head would be 25% yeah. of the AP diameter. Yep. Um, I did one yesterday, which was about 20%, so I did, actually did that arthroscopically because yes. uh, the patient had a minimal heel sax lesion. Uh, he were, so you've got to tell your treatment to the patient as well. Yeah. He was... He was uh, 25 and a carpenter and was happy to give away football okay. so then it's a bit different yeah, yeah so then arthroscopic procedure makes makes More sense. sense yeah then less less morbidity is really un- a good arthroscopic procedure should have a re- relatively low recurrence rate especially if you're not going back to contact or yeah. above overhead sport so so in that sort of scenario and there was some discussion at the x-ray meeting as to whether we should be doing a latage or, or not and, and given the given the patient factors rather than just the surgical factors then that was that was the decision that was mm. that was made so but in terms of in terms of making the decision yeah 25 percent would be the absolute if it's sort of the 20 percent mark like this one yesterday it's an open discussion yeah, yeah. with a with maybe a a big heel sax lesion that would push me more towards a yep. bony procedure. So it's not just the the size of the bank heart lesion; yes. it's the size of the heel sax lesion as well. As well, yeah, yeah, and that makes sense. I think, like, uh, it's an interesting conversation to have with patients because you know some of them they're so keen to kind of get back quickly and having that discussion about okay, well, you've actually lost bone structure here, and in order for this to actually get to some form of integrity, we need to really consider the surgical procedure that you're, you're undergoing. Yep. Um, how do you find, in, from your point of view, um, in the review, how do you find the difference between them, yeah, you know, in terms of the speed at which they can return to, to sport if they do go back to sport, and you know, what kind of process you like to see from, from the patient? Yeah, so I, I find, I keep my arthroscopic soft tissue stabilizations in, uh, in a sling for six weeks. Yep. I go very slowly with those. The is there a particular type of sling that you like to use, or do you just use like a standard? No, just a just a standard sling. I think because um, it was it was a, like I'll say this from a personal point of view. That at one point, I was wearing one of those sort of like uh, those ones or that ex- had me. Yeah, external the external rotation. rotation or the or the abduction sling. Yeah. So. so I think they 
they came into vogue yeah. uh, and were very uh, popular for a while, but I don't think they've been shown in the literature any, to make any difference. Yeah. So, so it's just easier, cheaper, and just and also people find I don't know how you found it, but external awkward. rotation is, is awkward, uncomfortable, sometimes more painful than just having your arm mm. relaxed down there. So, that, so overall, I don't think there's any benefit. To them, the only times I would use an abduction sling is a, is a big rotator cuff tear, or if I'm doing um, something like a McLaughlin procedure, which is a lesser tuberosity transfer for a uh, posterior dislocation, where you've got a reverse heel sacs lesion, yeah. and you want them to avoid them internally rotating. Yes, yeah. So then, that, that's really the only indication I would use for those mm. now. Yeah, interesting. Speaking of instability, um, one thing that you hear a lot. Of Discussion now is multi-directional instability, mm-hmm. and a question I have for you is: Do you think we need to look at things like multi-directional instability that's say associated with hypermobility? It's very different to looking at instability following traumatic incident where you've had a dislocation, for instance. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it is different, but I think you should consider because obviously, um, if you look at the traditional teaching or classification of uh, instability uh, it was certainly the have you heard of the tubs and ambry class, uh, yep. acronyms so i actually haven't okay so tubs is basically a traumatic dislocation mm-hmm. and ambry is multi-directional instability now it's okay. an acronym i think tubs yeah. stood for i remember it it was trauma uh, traumatic unidirectional oh, okay. bank art s and the s was need surgery mm. and the ambry was um a traumatic, multi-directional, B was bilateral, mm. R was rehabilitate, and then I was inferior capsular shift if all, if all of that had, mm-hmm. had failed. So that, but clearly people don't fall into one group or the other. There's a, there's a spectrum of disease like, or pathology like everyone else. So the more recent classification, which I think most people use, is the Stanmore classification, which is the polar one, two, and three. Have you heard of Head of that one, no. so they divide it up as a as a as a triangle. So at the top is the polar one, which is like the tub. So that's a traumatic instability, and then po- polar two is a traumatic instability, and then polar three is the abnormal muscle patterning. So that's the kind of um, uh, people, the guys or you know, the teenagers who can do their party tricks and they can just pop their <laughs> pop their shoulders out at, at will. So they've got gross abnormal. Pat, muscle patterning and actually we do EMG studies on those it's interesting they have got uh, definite abnormality on their on their EMGs as well mm-hmm. and then between the th- between the th- so clearly most people fall between the three but the, the idea is you consider all three because people can move between them mm-hmm. depending how long they're waiting for treatment they, they could have abnormal muscle patterning and then get a traumatic episode or they could have a traumatic episode and then develop abnormal muscle patterning as a secondary effect Mm -hmm. and on top of that you've got people who are ligamentally lax and not as well so you basically can move anywhere on that on that triangle and it's and and it's just it clearly you can't classify your two-thirds up one way and one-third on the other but it just makes you think about the factors involved and and just um have hopefully will guide treatment because it may be if it's uh and this this is difficult with patients trying to convince them that they need One or rehab the yeah. before surgery. Well, I was, was going to ask yeah. you that. How how do you, in your mind, when you look at something like that that polar, clef, polar classification, where are you thinking? Yes, surgery is one hundred percent indicated. Where are you thinking? Oh, this is fifty fifty. Maybe we do trial some conservative management. Yep. It's non surgical. And then when do you think? No, this this you know this one I'm unsure. I need to kind of look at something before I actually make this decision. Yeah, so I think the, the polar one, so the traumatic... Yeah, so almost that's, similar to the tubs one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's uh, generally male, contact score, pretty well muscled and, and, and good muscle patterning. Before. Someone that plays rugby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, and then you would think, um, I, I want to go back to a sport that's got a high recurrence rate, mm-hmm. so I'd like to do it again. So I think they're more likely to need surgery. Um, and more likely to get offered surgery in my in my practice. Um, if you come in and examine them, and they go, oh, my other shoulder's a bit funny as well, and then you examine them, and the scapula's not quite right when, they, when you're looking at their at their range of movement, uh, you might think, oh, let's just hold off here. Yeah, there's something else yeah, going on as yeah. well. So mm-hmm. let's, and then you need to get uh, a specialist sort of physios involved, and then, and I would say a reasonable proportion of those then don't come on 
to need surgery. surgery. Yeah, okay. because so you have to be careful then too, because even if there is an associated traumatic incident, Correct. that in itself is not going to be definitive of you do need surgery because they might have that underlying multidirectional instability, whether it be dysfunction in their muscular patterns or ligamentous laxity or Correct. a combination of the yeah, both. And, really. and there are other factors involved, such as glenoid version and mm. glenoid morphology mm. and, and shape of the glenoid, shape of the humeral head. Mm. Um, but I think certainly I, I, I tend to be quite aggressive getting scans, which is, which is um, sometimes problematic because patients get to read the, read the report. But the... Uh, when you say aggressive, what, 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 do you, what do you mean by that? So, uh, so I basically always get a scan. So I'd always get, always get an MRI, and if there's a hint of any bony pathology, I'd always get a CT scan yeah, so you, as well. You're really trying to investigate with, and get as much information as you can about, as you said, those features of morphology and what changes are there, and that's very, very Correct. important for your decision-making. Yeah, and, and, the, and to define any structural pathology or rule out, rule out any structural pathology. Yep. So you may have the, the patient we talked about whose both shoulders are a bit funny and they've had a traumatic episode playing basketball and the shoulder's gone and they've, they've kind of put it back in or they've gone to mm. ED and it's kind of gone in pretty easily. Mm. And they may get an MRI, which may look pretty much normal. Mm. Uh, may uh, Not much of a label tear, no high signal in the human... So... They, so um, those ones you'd be thinking, okay, so this is more likely to be a functional problem rather than a structural problem that I can help with. So those then I'd be pushing more towards the rehab side of things before going, going to surgery. surgery yeah. If they've got a big label tear or a small bony bank or even a big bony bank, then that obviously pushes you more towards towards the other side. So. Yeah, okay. In terms of that process and that discussion, you know, like... Uh, has your approach in terms of communication changed over time? You know, we talk about this a lot of communication and almost, we, you know, we mentioned in one of our recent podcasts, you know, the iatrogenic effect of communication. How has that kind of evolved for you? Because as a surgeon, you do have a unique position where there is a unique level of trust, at least on the medical hierarchy, mm -hmm. that what you're saying is likely to be accurate and, and likely and to be... Definitive. And definitive. That's right. Yeah. So how does that communication... How have you found yourself develop in that area when it comes to say, okay, you definitely need surgery or no, I actually think you would... I recommend that you try rehabilitation. Have you actually evolved that or is it something that as your you know, level of experience and, and comfortable um, you know, clinical uh, knowledge has increased... You, you're just more definitive and say, like, do this, and I don't really want to hear any more discussion about it. <laughs> no, no, I think I, it's, 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 that's a great question because it's, re it's really hard, and, it, and, it, and it's, I think it's a constantly evolving thing. I don't, yeah. I don't think I'll say, yes, I've, I've made it there, now my communication is excellent, and now I know what to do. Because you, you need to read the patient as well, actually, because... What are their expectations? Exactly, yeah. because if, if, they, if they've been seen by... A trainer at the side of the field, he put the shoulder back in. Right, like, you need you need surgery, mm. or uh, the GPs read the report and or they've got the report and they said you need surgery, or their friend had it and they had. So it's really difficult to kind of unpick that. I think you, um, it's helpful if they're especially if they're young, if they're sort of eighteen, twenty, if they could come with a parent. Is that actually really useful because the parent can kind of reinforce the the messaging. Yeah, exactly, but. Uh, I mean, and quite often they do in that age group, which is useful actually. But mm. um, I think uh, it's difficult. I think if you if you've got a if you've got a scan report and you think they don't need surgery, uh, I think you have to be positive about the fact they don't need surgery. So you say, great news, you don't you don't need surgery uh, because of X, Y, or Z. Now. Um, the problem the, the problem is some some people will treat based purely on the on the scan mm. and if the patient has it in their mind they need surgery and you're not offering them they may well go shopping yes exactly which well, yeah how do you like that was the, the follow-up question how do you deal with those people where um it's sort of the opposite situation where you think they need surgery but they're actually maybe scared of the surgery or they don't they were sort of maybe initially told you don't probably need it mm -hmm. um how does that process go is or are people generally quite trusting when you put that recommendation forward no you get some no mo most people are i would say yes but you get some some patients go oh, i was hoping to avoid surgery or, mm -hmm. or that sort of thing um so in in that scenario i would um uh, quite a 
collegiate ban- bunch of colleagues. So we certainly at uh, Eastern Health, so we have a upper limb uh, meeting every sort of six weeks, and so we discuss that. Story. So I'm, so quite often I say to the patient, okay, well, we have a meeting of six shoulder surgeons. Yeah, we'll discuss this. We'll discuss it then, and I'll give you a call after that. So I've got two patients That's good. to discuss at the, at the next meeting, and then most people bring a couple of patients. Sometimes we bring patients in and examine the patient in front oh, of everyone. Cool. So it's quite a, it's quite a good uh, process we've got going on. It's a, it's a really nice process that I think gets formalised in the public setting more so than it seems to happen in private. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, we've tried to set that sort of environment up here in our clinic, and it, we always find it quite interesting because just because of timetabling, sometimes you say to someone, okay, you need to be in rehab yeah. twice a week, whatever, and you're like, oh, I'm going to put you with such and such. Yeah. And they, they say, oh, but, well, they know what to do. And they say, well, well we kind of work as a team. So um, understand that, like, not only do we have similar philosophies, but we actually work in a way in which we're trying to achieve these outcomes through collaboration anyway. Yep. Yep. You know, often if it's a difficult case, we're discussing it in our team meeting because someone's saying, well, I'm trying this, but I'm not actually getting the outcome I want. What other steps can I take? Yeah. I think that that's a really nice thing that seems to be very well formalised in the public setting. And I think from a surgical point of view, I'm sure it happens a lot in even the, the private as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. The um, the kind of uh, reinforcement that they're, you're having the right the right treatment because that's, I guess, in some cases, that's one of the reasons why why you're bringing patients to these meetings mm. to reassure the patient that they're... That, that what they've been advised is the correct, correct thing to do. Um, for, uh, this meeting, though, is not it's not just public patients. It's any it's any patients. It's just it's just to have a discussion at a kind of consultant level mm. of interesting patients or difficult yeah. patients. So sometimes they're public patients. Sometimes they're 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 private patients. I think in sometimes patients aren't happy to wait because that meeting's every six weeks. And I go, okay, well, I'll offer you a. Um, offer you a second opinion is, yeah. there, is there anyone you want to go and, and see. see so always ask the patient first if there's anyone they've heard of they want to go and see before otherwise i'll i'll recommend someone yeah it's interesting and it's, it's really pleasing to hear you talk about this it's something that we we mention a lot so i'm sure our listeners are probably like shut up <laughs> saying the same thing over and over but we always talk about you know the original model of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practices put forward by david sackett in mm-hmm. the early 90s and the fact that like it's not just made up of say the literature, it, it does have those other aspects that are related to clinical experience and also the patient's expectations and values. And I think that those things sometimes don't necessarily, uh, particularly expectations and values, don't necessarily always get put into what is considered evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice. Um, so it, it's really pleasing to hear that you're going to such a level of effort to make sure that that person's expectations are being met. Yeah, I think, and I think, I think it's really important because um, if you can't meet their expectations or you don't think there's an intervention you've got that will meet their expectations, then, then you can end up with an unhappy patient yeah. and a, an unhappy surgeon as mm. well. And then you might get the physio ringing you all the time again, they're not improving, the patient's not happy, what should we, is there anything else we need to add in or that sort of thing? So um, now I think if you get it right from the start, then hopefully it'll, get, it'll be right towards the end. Clearly there's going to be times when that's not the case and there's a mismatch but yeah. if you do what you can to try and try and um, optimize that i think that's a good way to go i was going to ask a, a question i think talking about expectations and beliefs of patients is one part of that equation when you send someone for a scan is the report from the radiologist mm-hmm. and this is something that like, we've again talked about in the clinic of certain radiologists describe what they're seeing differently to others mm-hmm. And particularly, too, when you're seeing something that may be relevant to their presenting condition, but also when it's not relevant. So, like, mm-hmm. a good example is, you know, you might be saying that there's degenerative changes within the joint. But if that's a, a 50-year-old individual who's played contact sports throughout their, uh, their life, that's probably an expected finding that's not really relevant or will actually be interesting to hear your thoughts of whether they actually need surgery or not and whether they actually describe it as such of, like, they're, although there are degenerative changes, this is probably something not associated with their presenting condition that they've had a traumatic incident. Yeah, that is, that is an interesting point. Uh, you do notice sometimes, and it's maybe the more experienced and sometimes maybe the less experienced, but they, they will almost make sort of like clinical recommendations. Yes. It'd be interesting to get your opinion on this. I, mm. I, I don't know what my position is, but 
Sh- do you think that that's a position for a radiologist to do that or not? Because well, cause it, I feel or, like or are there frustrations too? Yeah. Like sometimes when a radiologist writes something, you go, mm. you probably haven't written that in the way that's very constructive for what the patient. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Uh, and they don't have to see the patient again. Yeah, so exactly. I'll, I'll You've got to deal with that exactly. So I think more more commonly, um, most most people will, will be not that definitive in my practice. There was the, a common thing will be. Uh, clinical correlation advised, or um, in the in the right clinical context, uh, a cortisone injection may be beneficial. So mm. I don't find that they're too definitive. definitive yeah. So which is which is useful. If they're being very definitive, it will be it would be difficult. Mm. Um, is it, do you use certain radiologists, or is it just the people that are in the same network as, as where you work, or, or do you have people that you go to because you really do want no, specific if, finding I think, investigations done? Um, no, I think in the in the network where I work, I think most radiologists are, are pretty good. Uh, occasionally, I'll repeat a scan if I'm not happy if the patient's been elsewhere and, mm-hmm. and it doesn't. Yeah, sometimes the, the the actual scan itself is not that good. Or yeah, so the quality uh, of the images. Mm. Or yeah. I think often patients don't realise that that. An MRI, this isn't an MRI. Like Correct. Yeah. There is yeah, actually yeah. That's such a pain in the ass. You, yeah. Especially if you get, sometimes we get people travel from different areas. I'm sure you yeah, probably yeah. get them from all over at times. And you say, all right, here's the referral. Go and get this done here yeah. or here. Don't go anywhere else. Yeah. But they're predominantly musculoskeletal radiologists. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And, you know, we usually see sporting conditions or whatever. Yeah. And mm. then they'll go and get it somewhere. And yeah. Even, you know, even with our limited radiology sort of understanding, you look at the scan, you're like, Okay, I think this was done on a Nokia fifteen ten. <laughs> this this MRI, like it's this is an ultrasound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I feel like, what is this? That's that's right. So um, it's uh, it's interesting about the, the patients getting their reports, though. What mm. what you were saying, yeah. because in my my practice, most of the time, because the GPs can arrange it, they'll arrange an ultrasound, yep. yeah. which is really variable, even more variable than the MRI. Very as subjective, yes, yeah. yeah. So, and then the patient reads the report, and so I don't even bother reading, I examine, <laughs> examine, the, examine the patient, uh, sorry, take a history, examine the patient, and work out what I think is going on yep. clinically. And then I've, and it's, um, and then I get an MRI, and I know MRI is very sensitive and can pick up things that maybe not relevant but that's why i think part of the skill is is He's reading that is yeah. reading that in in relation to their their findings and because they'll get the report of that as well so they'll come back and they'll go well what about this or what about that and i say well that's not that's not, that's not clinically yeah. significant yeah yeah, yeah so. you have that so often and i know that like i always find it like hard to almost not laugh you know that someone will have some sort of say traumatic incident so they're out skiing they felt, you know, the instability incident. You think, oh, well, they've, they've probably done their ACL in yep. their knee. And then, oh, I went to the GP and the GP did, you know, uh, uh, an X-ray or something. And you go, okay. And they go, yeah, so it's definitely, like, I haven't done my ACL. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> Unfortunately, we probably can't tell from the, you know, we might see some things. But we're probably not going to see that you're going to have to go get the scan. Yeah. And then it comes back and you go, yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, it's you've done it. And, Oh, but the GP said that I'd be okay. Yeah. And you're like, oh, well, well that, that's the other thing as well as the scans. It, it's the the first provider. The I think a lot of weight is put on what the first person they see yeah. tells them, and they've got that in their head. And even though they're seeing someone else, maybe seeing you guys, then going get MRI. It's 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 already embedded. Mm. That, it, that I'm gonna I'm gonna go completely off tangent. So tell me to to pipe down if I'm going too far left, but. I heard a really interesting theory of a similar thing about it's like almost like first respond. It's like a psychological thing where it's like the first responder um, kind of bias where, say with COVID, one of the ideas of why the whole world locked down was because when it first happened, it happened in China and China locked down. Yeah. So everyone thought that that was the appropriate response to this, you know, novel virus. Now, I'm not commenting on whether yeah, it was sure, or yeah. wasn't. I, yeah. These days, it's, uh, hopefully, it's behind us um, in, in that level of sense. But it's interesting because there was discussion by a few people who said if it had have happened, say, in a country where that wasn't their first response, what would the rest of the world actually done? Mm. And I think that that bias seems to be very prevalent, as you mentioned, when you have a patient where the first response they get from a, some sort of healthcare professional is X, then everything is framed off that response, yes. and and to me that's a very interesting um, idea. I don't I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but essentially I, I do think that there is something about 
understanding what your communication is and how definitive you maybe need to be and how sometimes how you need to leave things open because if you give someone a label, they will attach to it really quickly. It's actually, you know, it makes me think of John, and you and I have talked about this before, where we're falling into the trap on the other end of the spectrum when you someone presents and you go, oh, look, actually, it's not as bad as you think. But, again, if you were it in a way, we're like, oh, you're going to be fine. And they go, well, hang on, like, it actually hurts. So. Like, and it's not to say that you're going, oh, no, no, I'm not saying that you don't need treatment or that... Um, you don't need to rehabilitate totally. this, yeah. But um, you almost throw them off because they're like, well, hang on, there seems to be something wrong. And like, we, no, 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 there is, and we do need to actually address we've, this. We've had this problem recently, Richard, you'll probably laugh, and this is admitting our own ineptitude. <laughs> yeah. You know, where as, as you get more experience as a clinician, you've seen similar presentations. Mm-hmm. So in your mind, you're very confident about the outcome that you can get for them. But we're very casual, as you can tell now, and we're, we're not this casual with patients, but we're, you know, we, we try not to be overly formal with people because they're people. Yes. And so you say to them, yeah, look, it's this, you're going to be completely fine, this is the you know, protocol, what we're going to do, whatever. And there's been times where they'll get three, four, five, six weeks down the track and they're rehabilitated and they are making significant progress. Mm. But they're going, why is this taking so long? You said this was going to be really easy. Mm. And you said, oh, okay, like maybe I shouldn't have word the, yeah. used those kind of words because I've actually set them up to think that this was going to be a process that was going to be fast. Mm. Even though the process is clear and there's clarity around what we need to do, we've probably given them the wrong message yes. by telling them, oh, don't worry, like we've got this sorted. It's one of those situations where you're like, okay, I can see this how this is going to unfold, you know, as opposed to the ones we are like... Maybe you do need to get a surgical opinion or actually this might take several months yeah. or actually there's a lot going on here. You know, we probably need to work Further through Further investigations, yeah, send you yeah. to a sports physician yeah. or whatever it is. I mean, I think um, especially uh, for allied health, because you guys spend so much time, time with, with people, the patients, yeah. so you obviously have a lot more conversation and, and chat than, than we do. Um, and so... I, I think so. I don't, I'm not <laughs> blaming you guys. But, oh, no, but, we say some dumb things, but, don't but worry. I, but I think there can be the occasional casual remark, which is, which to you is nothing, but to the patient is they They've put taken a lot of weight on, on and, yeah. and then and then that builds up in their in their mind. And then... Oh, it, it's like that example of, oh, but I, I, I did my disc, you know. Yeah. I was told I did my disc, and they don't even necessarily know what that means. Yeah. And they associate that it's forever this pathological state. Yeah that will never heal and well, make some more vulnerable. We've, we've had a lot of that recently, you know, like obviously Jack is colleagues with David Delahar, yeah. um, a spinal surgeon, and we had him on the podcast and he was saying that, you know, like the number of times that even Jack's referred people to him for a surgical opinion and they'll say, oh, you know, Jack's already explained to them that they had a disc injury 10 years ago and they still think that that's the pathology that's yeah. causing the problem. and. Jack would be saying, well, you know, there's probably not much evidence, you know, it's probably reabsorbed by now and this yeah. and then. The, and then he'll say, okay, well, I'll send you to David. David, you know, he's one of the top surgeons in this area. Go on to, and David would go, oh, that, that pathology is clearly, you know, healed now. Like, this is a different issue. I'm going to do this, this, and this investigation. And they come back and they go, yeah, Jack, you were right. You were right. <laughs> I yeah. am. Da- David, David, David did say that I don't, like, it's probably not that old injury. Like, so, yeah. I mean, it's the whole thing about needing external validation sometimes. Yeah. About I remember um, hearing a podcast with, um, I don't know if you've heard of Kieran O'Sullivan, who's a physio and a researcher over in Ireland. Okay. He does a lot of work in back pain and chronic pain. He was... T- he, Use this example of a case study of a patient came and saw him with long-term low back pain. He goes, well, I know what the problem is. I've been told it from the scan. I've got this thing called a vertebrae. <laughs> and <laughs> Kieran, the, the, the um, clinician looks at him going, uh, yes. <laughs> and so obviously, and it's not that someone said, oh, you've got a vertebrae. Yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. through all the jargon, yeah. they heard vertebrae, they yeah. attached to it. And they thought, I, okay, hope, that's I hope this person has a vertebrae. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hopefully multiple. Um, <laughs> and they thought, okay, that's this is what's this weird vertebrae thing I've never heard of before. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. must be the cause of my symptoms and my problem. And so it's interesting what people latch on to, yeah, what yeah, they definitely. hear when you tell them. Definitely. I mean, the, the, the best example in my practice would probably be um, proximal humeral fractures, mm. which I treat non-operatively. So I get them in the rooms having been seen in an amount often a public emergency, emergency yeah. department, and they've been told they need an operation. Uh, and then they, they are some of my longest and hardest consultations because... You're trying to convince them. They don't. Yeah. And then they're sore for ages. 
and then they see you at three months and they're still sore and they're still stiff and they, mm. they, they just doubt you. And then once it gets to about six or nine months and it's, the pain's gone and they've got good movement again, then, then they kind of believe, but they, they, it's, it's hard work <laughs> those, first, okay, those first few appointments. On that note, you made me think of straight away fracture management um, is clavicular fractures. Uh-huh. Because over, well, since I've been working as a physio the last 10 years, it seems to have changed where initially it seemed that all clavicular fractures, even if they were displaced somewhat, they were managed conservatively. But I've heard recently that that's actually changed where they will typically do a open reduction internal fixation. Is that correct? Um, well, I... Um, I don't know if it's changed. My, my indications for, uh, and as far as I'm aware, these are what the literature would support as well, okay. is uh, a significant degree of overlap, so two and a half centimetres. Now, yeah. the, the argument is how do you measure that because on a plain X-ray, depends, it's an S-shaped bone and it's, yeah. Yeah, it's difficult to tell. So are you going to CT all of them? Probably not. Um, a high energy mechanism of injury mm. because they've got, they have got a, definitely got a higher rate of non-union so those are the two groups that i would offer surgery to but explain that there's still a rate of non-union even i mean the reason for fixing them really is to decrease decrease the non-union rate yes mm. um a, i've had one patient ever who came out to see me who was treated by someone else non-operatively and it was it was it was massively overlapped like, yeah. and it you get a lot of secondary had, issues yeah, yeah sort of crowding of the shoulder so we talked yeah. about osteotomy and mm. And doing that, so I've, I've done an osteotomy on that occasion uh, for in those sort of situations on maybe two occasions, but not very often. So the chance of you having a problem is low, but it's quite a big surgery if you then have to do an osteotomy and mm-hmm. fix it. And uh, the union rate is uh, the non union rate is about 15% without surgery, and it's about 5% with surgery. So there's still about a 5% of them okay. don't heal with surgery, and then you've got to go back in and bone graft and, mm. and things. So um, I think some people, some people will, well, so one of my colleagues <laughs> said, if you, you should fix them all because they've got a 100% malunion rate if you don't. <laughs> Big statement. <laughs> Which is true, they do, because yeah, they, they yeah, never yeah, heal yeah. anatomically. Yeah. So, they, so that is a factually well, correct yeah. statement, but uh, <laughs> I don't think that means you should uh, fix them all. Well, my mum's a good example of that. She used to do a lot of cycling. She's broken both collarbones on separate yep. occasions, but... Her left one clearly did not heal. Um, it was displaced somewhat, and yep. now it looks like that. Or you can actually feel the um, the discontinuity. The notch, yeah. But I, I think she has had union, but yeah. just you yeah, know, yeah. much. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, actually, that that variation. just reminds me the other the other reason you would would fix is people that carry backpacks a lot for work, so yeah. military patients and things. We would probably fix just because you get irritation over the lump from yeah from, from the, the backpack. Attack, yeah. yeah. Interesting. You know, one question I wanted to ask you because it's um, it's very interesting to, to see when we get students or even uh, young physios coming in. A lot of them seem very perplexed by the shoulder, and there's probably a reason for that. There seems to be uh, variability in outcomes and responses to a lot of common shoulder presentations. But one of the things that's also is, can be quite confusing is it seems to be the never-ending list of shoulder special tests. And so <laughs> That's right. keep I'll, adding, keep adding to them. Well, yeah. I mean, it seems to be to every part of the body, but particularly the shoulder. It seems that you can the, the, just do you think the that's, a, do you think that's a sign that we're lost. <laughs> well, perhaps, and I'm interested to see, like, how do you actually navigate your way through your clinical exam examination, thinking about like when special tests are appropriate, when they're not appropriate, and what information they actually give you? Because it seems to be that there's a lot of or specificity and sensitivity with a lot of these tests as well. Yeah, I think that's that's right. So that's that's a big area. I think this. I think that well, there's definitely over a, a hundred eponymously named mm. tests, special tests in the shoulder. I'm, I'm assuming you know them all. Then, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go through no, the Pennington no. test? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, well, that's that, that's why I think this problem. And I was thinking about why is it because there's, there's obviously special tests in the hip and knee and things, but nowhere near the, the same, volume, the same tests, number. Yeah. No. And I'm. And obviously, historically, people like to put their names to tests and, and, and that sort of thing. And I, and I just I just thinking about with the shoulder, it's got such a, a complex range of movement and compared to the other joints and how you can put it in different positions. Because if you look at some of the tests, they've internally rotated a little bit more or just changed the abduction or adduction and then 
tested it and called it called it something else, which is ba- it's basically a the variation same, of the same, same test. test. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's that's probably just because they can, mm-hmm. because they can they can say, oh, it's thirty degrees rather than sixty or whatever it may be. So that that may be one of the reasons. And, and the other thing is, what, as you mentioned earlier, is, is maybe we are a bit lost with with these shoulder tests because what you're actually what you're really doing is you've, you've got a possibly inflamed, certainly a painful shoulder, mm. and you're trying to aggravate it in a different position mm. and then trying to work out if it's aggravated in that position, is it this bit of anatomy that's that's injured or is it another bit? Um, so On that, sorry to dis- dis- that's all right. disrupt. Do you think that that's helpful? One of the things that I always, and uh, you, you, know, you can correct me if you think I'm an idiot, but basically... I found that the moment that I stopped worrying about what the specific pathological structure was in the shoulder, that shoulders became extremely easy to treat. And I feel like the, if you look at it much more from a broad principle, it's like, as you mentioned before, is it unstable? You know, does it actually have poor you know, function around the way in which it moves? Yeah. Whether is there indications of structural it, damage? It, yeah. yeah. As soon as you stop looking for, oh, it's this specific tendon or it's this specific mm. you know, position or whatever it is... And I understand it's completely different for surgery, but from a rehabilitation standpoint, it completely changed the way that I sure. viewed it, and all of a sudden it became very simple. And I feel like our huge desire, particularly in healthcare, to go down the pathoanatomical kind of course of managing injuries or you know musculoskeletal problems sometimes gets us into a lot of trouble mm-hmm. um, because we, we miss, as I said, you, you, you miss the forest for the trees. Yeah. No, no, I think that uh, is definitely the case, and probably, probably more so in shoulders as well. Because mm. I think there's a, a in shoulders, as you're aware, there's there's a big functional element to their symptoms. Yeah. It's not necessarily um, uh, the structural abnormality that is is causing what is the causing problem. It, yeah. it, it, and they're often presenting too with a non-traumatic presentation too. Correct. You know, it's different between yeah. playing footy and yeah. having a dislocation yeah. versus oh, my shoulders actually is sore, and yeah. there seems to be no particular. Which is, which is um, where the whole rotator cuff pathology yeah. becomes a, a huge talking yeah, point. Yeah, yeah exactly. A, a mind, minefield, really. So in, ter- in terms of examining, the t- there's probably about four to six special tests that I would use regularly. But, but like you say, you take a history and find out what, it, what is actually bothering you. Is it weakness? Is it yeah. stiffness? Is it pain? What, what really is, is, is kind of going on here before you even examine the... The yeah. patients. Well, I think that sort of goes back to John's point because, like, particularly with weakness or stiffness, is if we modify them, how does that actually change your symptoms? And yeah. like, it's a relatively simple, straightforward thing to do, but I think it's often overlooked. Of how much have you developed either inappropriate movement patterns, or even just like things like postural related because of an imbalance in your stiffness or and or weakness is actually starting to irritate or potentially like to stretch yes. a, a particular tissue structure where if it's a stretch for a long period of time, you start to get changes in its like perfusion. Um, it starts to become potentially inflamed, inflamed and start to send nociceptive signals. Yeah, and then you've got, and you've got yeah, knock-on effects as well and, and you've got post- postural effects. People mm. are sitting at computers all day, yeah, sort of slouching and they're, um, they're kind of getting tight at the front and weak at the back mm. and, and I think there's there's lots of lots of effect which is why um, people <laughs> having the results of their imaging it, when they've got some shoulder pain or some pain in the Especially shoulder re- yeah, yeah. in the shoulder mm-hmm. region is, is not is not helpful at all no. I don't think mm-hmm. and there seems to be because it's become more readily available particularly things like MRIs people are now savvy enough in terms of their medical understanding that oh, I want to get an MRI so mm-hmm. they'll go demand it from their GP or mm-hmm. whatever but as you said it's not always helpful because yeah. as you said there's a functional element particularly to these non-traumatic presentations it's like that's not telling us a hell of a lot and, you yeah. know they'll come and they'll say I've got bursitis and you're like yeah. well so does everyone yeah, 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 yeah you know like that's not a helpful you know and they, sometimes they'll come to you and you do all the special tests for bursitis and, and none of them will be positive yeah so yeah and they'll go well that clearly isn't causing your your pain but, presentation yeah, exactly. at least yeah. yeah with we spoke about this in actually one of our podcasts and I don't know if you've thought about this much but the difference between say rotator cuff tendinopathy and and tendon pain and rotator cuff you know, pain in general, and how that differs from, say, lower limb tendinopathies and the pain presentations that you have with those. 
Um, now, I know obviously lower limb is not necessarily your area of uh, specialisation, but have you thought much about why we see certain presentations when it comes to the rotator cuff itself? No, no I, mean, I think there are, I haven't sort of sat down and analysed the difference uh, per se, but I think um, if, if you think about it, the, the, a lot of the lower limb tendinopathies are generally due to uh, are a classic overuse or mm -hmm. an increase in activity yeah. over a short period of time if you think about Achilles tendinopathy mm -hmm. or patella tendinopathy whereas the, the shoulder tendinopathy seems to be more of a part of the aging process more of a kind of aches and pains of of life really if you look at the degeneration and and symptoms as we as we get older um that's pretty common the prevalence of rotator cuff mm. tendinopathy whereas i don't think achilles tendinopathy is that common and particularly as we get older or and you, not you not guys very, have a better idea than common in non-athletic populations yeah. but and this is something that um you know a question I, I i put forward to you with is particularly now in our society we don't have to do a lot of physical activity yeah so you know why is it that we're seeing i could i'm actually not even sure if there is a higher prevalence but we see certainly see a lot of rotator cuff tendon uh, tendinopathy and shoulder pain associated with that even though people aren't actually being very very physically active they're not necessarily participating in a lot of overhead sports or um, you know doing a lot of resistance training or things like that we see it a lot of the time in the general population people yep. who are very sedentary yeah well I, th I think well if you look at the if we just look at the raw numbers it, mm. um, and we'll, we'll, we won't muddy the waters with partial tears we'll just talk about full thickness yeah. uh, rotator cuff tears uh, there's been Lots of population studies in Asian populations, Western populations, male groups, female groups, and one figure s seems to be pretty uh, uh, consistent about that is that uh, if you take a, a population of adults, about 20% of them will have a full thickness yeah. rotator cuff tear. Is that symptomatic? Or no, no. So then, so then, uh, and then obviously, as you get over 80, it then becomes like 50%, and under 30 is pretty close to zero um, but then if you look at the which of those are symptomatic well it's about one third two thirds split so a third will be asymptomatic mm. sorry a third will be symptomatic and two thirds will be asymptomatic uh, and it, the interesting thing is when you get older although the prevalence of tears increases mm. the per percentage of those that are asymptomatic also increases so it's mm. more than two thirds of them are asymptomatic so and, and like from from that general you know development point of view have you thought about like why do we actually develop these these cuff tears uh, I think, and part of that too is why what does that tell us about anatomy and mechanics? yeah that, that's what i mean like have you thought about that as a more broad yeah. kind of like what's why are we ending up with this presentation symptomatic or not but why does it even occur so so prevalently in the population as we age yeah, I, don't, I, don't know. I mean, if you look at the tendon collagen, it's type one collagen, like like there is eighty yeah. percent, ninety percent of the mm -hmm. collagen in the in the in the body is mm -hmm. type one type one collagen. Um, you, I think there's probably an inflammatory component to it. If you look mm -hmm. at, um, say, the irreparable rotator cuff tears, where you've got fatty infiltration, there's a lot of macrophage mediated activity going on there. So I think it's probably potentially a a sign of, um, I guess, a musculoskeletal manifestation of maybe a systemic mm. systemic thing. And, and unfortunately, generally, the population is not getting any fitter. They're getting no. less fit. Well, it seems to be the case that almost every discussion now when it comes to these ongoing degenerative changes to the body, whether they be, you know, visceral or otherwise, but even musculoskeletal seems to be that, like, there seems to be an inflammatory component to these and your general metabolic health, I know that Jack asked a question yeah. about that, seems to be a big factor in the development of these degenerative changes over time. And I, I think it is. I mean, just anecdotally, eyeballing my, a lot of patients with symptomatic rotator cuff mm. tears will be overweight. Yes, mm. okay. Uh, not, they're not manual workers who they're are... Not, they're not healthy sort of individuals no, who in are, general. Yeah, I mean, you do get the acute, acute tears in those things. But, but I mean, it's only anecdotal. I haven't looked at my... BMIs of all my patients, but that's but that's just from patients that walk through the walk through the door. And I think, yeah, yeah go on, sorry. I was going to yeah. say because it's interesting. I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's some similar statistics in Australia, but if you look at say the United States, which 
it's probably in a worse health state than Australia, but 80% of the population are in a pre-diabetic state. Yeah. Again, which is infl- reflective of that metabolic syndrome or, and you know, likely to develop diabetes at one point. So the prevalence is so high, it seems to be something that's so relevant to a lot of uh, people's presentation, particularly in the general population group when they seem to have indications of poor health. Yeah. And then obviously on, t- on top of that with rotetica, if you've got a higher instance in smokers, mm. di- diabetic. Interestingly, they are more common in the dominant arm even if we're not saying if we're yeah. saying it's not a traumatic thing it is more common in the dominant well arm. i think it's reflective of it's it's not to suggest that there aren't mechanical components to it there certainly is but it's how the metabolism the actual tissue turnover or collagen synthesis versus breakdown is influenced by the immune system and the inflammatory state because like those macrophages are really key signals to determine how tissue is either synthesized or broken down, and particularly that ratio between the two. That's right. And, and if you look at the way they rotate the cuff tears healed, mm. you don't get normal tendon bone healing like you do in other areas of the body. You get like a fibrovascular scar, which is never as strong as, as, a, as a tendon to bone healing. And if you, if you look at the in terms of Healing rates, then there's different patterns which you may be aware of, of for fixing tears, but the commonest now would be we've got a double row repair. So you have one row of sutures, sutures uh, suture anchors pass through the tendon and then they get passed over the top and crossed over and then over a, a row, normally four, probably four on average, two medial and two lateral, mm-hmm. which then helps sort of cinch the tendon down. So that's got the highest healing rate on imaging but clinically, there's no difference. So, and as you know, up to, well, some studies, 44% of rotator cuff repairs re-tear anyway. But mm. interesting that a lot of those aren't symptomatic. Mm. So there's something else going on which we're not, we're not sure about. So, something that we've gotten really interested in um, that I, I wonder whether you guys are starting to look at some of this is <laughs> we've spoken a lot about in musculoskeletal injuries, whether it's post-surgery or whether it's just in a rehabilitation kind of conservative management setting, when you're trying to get the tissue to heal, you obviously need to apply some mechanical stimulus to that. It's typically the, you know, the most common way in which that signaling occurs. It needs to occur in a metabolically healthy sort of state. Otherwise, that inflammatory response is probably going to lead to poor signaling. But the other one is actually the nutritional status. And you, you mentioned type 1 collagen, and it's obviously become something that's really popular for tendon rehabilitation, and it's really exploded in the last probably three to five years, especially a lot of work's come out of Keith Barr's lab um, in the US looking at supplementation along with mechanical loading for um, healthy populations, active populations coming back from things like patella tendinopathy. Is that something that you guys are starting to look at or healing post, say, rotator cuff repair, where you're like, what actual you know, nutritional items can we maybe do to help with what actually the quality of that healing is? Uh, not, not that I've read or, or seen in the... Uh, I mean, I've got a couple of shoulder meetings a year. I've not seen any, any work, work on that. In, obviously, just going to the supermarket, you'll see there's a lot more collagen yeah. supplements hmm. and things it's available super now. Popular. Yeah, mm. which and the only kind of nutritional supplement I give routinely is actually I give vitamin C to all yes. my yep. all my patients. That's for a couple of reasons, uh, uh, but mostly because of uh, reduced instance of complex regional pain syndrome, yes. uh, particularly the sort of distal radius fractures and hand hand surgery. Uh, but also, there's some studies that show that. Do you, what, is there a mechanism that? No, not that no, not people, anyone knows. People of. don't no. know what. But no. it, it's, it's pretty consistent. It's one of those anec- anecdotal things, mm. and then and they looked at. It was actually the study on that was to, sorry to digress. No, go, go, go. Uh, the, the original study on that was done by a anaesthetist, and it was probably about 2007. It was done, so it's quite a quite a time ago now, uh, and this was particularly with distal radius fractures, and uh, he looked at different doses and different lengths of treatment and uh, over a huge population number, uh, a huge study numbers uh, and found that uh, there is a benefit in reducing the instance of CRPS and uh, the, the, the actual dose that you needed was 500 milligrams 
for 50 days. Mm -hmm. That's quite an odd prescription because yeah. most, most of them come in 90 tablets in the jar and they're a gram so it's easy just to give it for three because you're not going to any adverse effects so mm. so i just give it for for three months so mm. um but then there's more studies recently from the states look and this was in the lower limb well and they're looking at analgesic requirements post hip and knee arthroplasty and they were actually doing the study to look at clps um, and they found, as, again, an, as an anecdotal finding, that the group that were having vitamin C required less opiate analgesia in the post-operative yeah. period. So, again, I'm not sure on the mechanism of, of that, but I think nutritional things uh, will probably come into play more, more generally because they're, they're cheaper, mm. safer, well, non-addictive. It, it, make, it makes sense on lots of fronts. Now, obviously, we need to validate that they are actually effective. Otherwise, mm. you're just taking... Yes, these things for no reason. Well, but it, it is a strong antioxidant. So yeah. you wonder if it's altering someone's redox status and how that influences perhaps like centrally mediated yeah. mechanisms and yeah. or and the autonomic nervous system yeah. regulation. The, the, the one that we're super interested in, we hope someone does the studies because we're not in this, is the use of type two collagen mm. for articular cartilage. Yes, um, it hasn't really as in oral supplementation. You mean? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. hard to get because it's only in certain things like. Uh, cartilage yeah it's yeah. in cartilage <laughs> yeah you know so you actually you know like col type one collagen is easy to usually because you get it from skin usually yeah from well bovine yeah skin. i was gonna say most people probably don't want to hear it but it's they usually <laughs> boil down yeah. bovine skin yeah, and then yeah. you turn it into powder whereas the the type two collagen usually one of the one supplements that you put forward was was made from trachea mm. right oh, that's okay. so yeah. it, it's not obviously yeah. as readily available yeah um and the, the research hasn't been done so we're not sure but that is a very Are you meaning in people with with diagnosed articular. osteoarthritis and and potentially say chondral lesions mm. and yeah. things like that, especially mm. for say younger you know patients. we obviously deal with younger patients yeah, yeah. who are in sport and you know they've done something to their knee they've got a chondral lesion they're getting pain you know and it's it's one of those things of like okay you're just going to need to manage this yeah. through the rest of your career and then long term you're going to have early onset OA um, all of these kind of things and I'm going to say like just to add to that because. It's, it's sort of essentially building on some of the research of looking at type 1 collagen supplementation for managing tendon tendinopathy. Because I said what's important, what's shown to be valuable is re type 1 collagen reducing pain. But there's also at least some case studies coming out that it may actually help with the remodeling of the tendon if you consume it prior to the mechanical load. And mm. the rationale is because you're going to have an increase of the amino acids in type 1 collagen. Mm -hmm mainly glycine well, was, yeah. and proline. Yeah. You can probably that, describe, I don't know if you've seen it, but do you want to describe that study? It was only, I think it was only one patient, but that, oh, with Keith, Keith Barr, Barr did yeah. it at, he did it at a conference. About, was it an NBA player? Yeah, it was a, for patellar tendon tendinopathy. So yeah. he had clear indications of degenerative changes. And like yeah, a hyper, hyper echoic yeah, area yeah. within his patellar tendon. You know, like that clear um, presentation where you've got like that dead spot in the yeah. tendon that suggested that that won't remodel. In mm -hmm. fact, they used a uh, particular rehab protocol with type 1 collagen they found after i think it was like 50 days yeah 53 days or something that the tendon had returned completely to normal on mri on mri yeah okay wow. now again yeah. n equals one here. yeah yeah sure but it's a starting right. point um yeah and whether you actually can apply that same uh principle that same method to articular tissue with type 2 collagen again with mechanical loading because one of the things that's very evident with connective tissue is fluid dynamics are the big thing that allows it to draw in nutrients mm -hmm. by you know applying mechanical load displacing water and then when you lax it draws in fluid and nutrients from the interstitium uh, i mean it's one of those things it's it's a it's a theory which anecdotally we've trialed with some patients too seem to have had some at least um subjective changes in their yeah. pain i mean as you're aware obviously tendinopathy is really difficult to treat anyway yeah. or well, so, well, maybe not. It, it's interesting. <laughs> I think there's, um, I think sometimes there's a bit of a. Um, there seems to be a lot of clinicians who do things that go beyond a lot of the general recommendations to tendon management. It seems to be catching up because I think initially it was all all just about just do really heavy loading. You know, if you've got Achilles tendon pain, just do seated squat, uh, seated calf raises, for instance. Yeah. Or if you've got um, patellar tendon pain, just do leg extensions. Yeah. But thinking a bit beyond that of, well, what's the actual role of tendons? 
a lot of it is about force transmission, but a mm. lot of it's also about energy storage and release. And thinking about how you actually, this is more in athletic populations who sure. are otherwise healthy, but actually replicating what the tendon does in a structured fashion so it actually builds up the appropriate properties and stiffness to be able to essentially act like a spring. And I think that's often the thing that seems to be missed um, where thinking that just heavy work is going to be the only thing that's necessary for someone to manage an Achilles tendon pain when they're a elite sprinter, for an yeah. example. Yeah. It makes me think, like, and I'll ask you a question, Richard, and you, and you, you can uh, refuse to answer it if you like, but um, I've thought a lot about this concept, particularly when it comes to you know things like bone, and there seems to be, particularly when you speak to... Well, all the evidence when it comes to tissue, any connective tissue structure um, or soft tissue structure seems to respond very clearly to mechanical loading. Mm -hmm. If you traditionally look at a lot of the management of things like bone and even with tendon and particularly say like post-surgical repair, there seems to be a lot of conservatism about how quickly you can mechanically load that. Is there and this is my ignorance if it is out there, is there a shift in how early people are starting to look at these things as there has been with things, say, like non-operative tendon pain and also things like muscle strain injuries? Mm. You know, the, even in, in Melbourne here, I came out of the... There's a hamstring injury study group at ACU um, and a guy named Jack Hickey, who I spoke to actually before he did this study, but he's published all of these papers and it's basically like you, you strain your hamstring yep. and you can start loading it basically the same day right okay right and they're finding that they get a faster reduction in pain faster return to activity and less re-injury rates yeah we don't seem to have that same mentality when it comes to say a post-surgical repair we don't seem to have the same mentality when it comes to some sort of like bony issue um and i know they're different i'm not, yep. I'm not trying to say they're not but do you think that that will evolve over time as as we said because this is, again, this is a tangent, but you say, like, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, if an animal falls over and breaks its leg, it keeps moving or it dies, right? Correct, yeah. We fall over and break our leg and then we're doing nothing for the next six, eight, 12 weeks. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that that will change? Because clearly we are evolved to continue putting some mechanical stress through that tissue. Yeah, I think it probably is a little bit, not, not to the extent that we load everything on, no, on no. day one, yeah, yeah. but... Uh, from my, uh, so just thinking of a few of the examples in, in my practice, so if you, you're talking of, say, uh, an ankle fracture, hmm. so I, I, if I fix an ankle fracture, I let them weight bear from yeah. day one. They don't because it's too sore, so yeah. they, so they self, like, self-protect. It seems like that's you know, that evolution is happening, it's changing where people are getting more aggressive with how quickly yeah. they're allowing people, as whether they do it or not is yeah. different. yeah. And then uh, what else? Uh, distal radius fractures. So distal radius fractures that need fixation. Uh, if it's a 50-50 call uh, and we're trying to decide between surgery or non-surgery, the, one of the things I speak to the patients about is if we, if we fix it, we'll allow you to mobilise from day one. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that's better than six weeks in the car. So yeah. they'd rather just get on. They can drive sooner. They can... Yeah look after their kids, do whatever they need to do. So I think um, it is changing. I think stabilisations are probably, certainly soft arthroscopic stabilisations are, are, are slightly different because you've got three small anchors with a lot of tension going through them. Mm. And I think, and sometimes that tissue is really quite thin and wavy. And so the concern does, does is... That, does that, oh, a question for you. Does that tension actually assist in that healing process, do you think, at any level? Or does it have the potential to? Like, do you actually tension it in a way that you're trying to create some mechanical st stress through that tissue? Yeah, I think I think you need to mm. because uh, if it's um, if it's floppy, it's not going to heal. So yeah. I've I've changed anchors before in the past where I've done the I've put into the bone, passed it through the labrum, tensioned it down, and I've not been happy with the mm. with the tension. So certainly, I think a degree of tension is is necessary. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not going to heal back yeah, to the, yeah. back to the glenoid. Um, rotator cuff again is a, a minefield, but it's another interesting one because there, there has been studies in the past looking at early mobilisation compared to four weeks, which is, which would be a pretty standard time in a in a sling. And um, as far as I'm aware, there's no difference in, yeah. in in outcome, and especially given what we said about 
a lot of them don't heal anyway, or they don't. If they do heal, they don't heal with a normal tendon bone yeah. interface. Then, what really is to be gained by keeping them in the sling? For and I, um, I do a reasonable number of work cover patients, and sometimes they're not the most compliant. <laughs> <really>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they can, that's they, the, the most valid statement <laughs> ever made. <laughs> they come with their own challenges. Yeah. No, exactly. But 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 sometimes they turn up for their two week wound review. And they've dri- they've driven there. Yeah, and you're like, what happened? Yeah, and they say, I'm got, oh, I'll stop wearing it off for a couple of days. And so, uh, and again, their outcomes don't seem to be any different to people who diligently keep their arm in a sling for six weeks. So I think I'm glad that you have patients that also are non-compliant. <laughs> so I always wonder: is it, do they listen to surgeons all the time? No, they but, don't. Oh, they okay. don't. <laughs> um, we ticked over an hour and five. But uh, uh, if you're happy to keep going, uh, there's a couple more questions yeah, sure. that I actually um, wouldn't mind asking you. Like, I, th- I think you, you sort of have touched on just there, like some ideas around sort of how you attack these things. And it's always, every time we have a surgeon on, I, I basically ask the same question, but it's one of the cool things that I think about surgeons and surgery in general is that to me it differs a little bit from other areas of medical practice where they, and I think it comes a little bit with the territory, but they seem to have much more of an exploratory kind of and almost an engineering sort of idea of how they approach things because they're trying to solve problems that are often unique to that person, their anatomy, as you said mentioned before, the desires that they have for what they want to return to. And so there's a level of creativity around what you need to be able to do. And to me, that creates opportunities where it seems like often surgery moves faster than other areas of medical practice in terms of progression. Um, Is that in any way something that attracted you to surgery compared to being, say, a physician? Um, And do you think that that will continue on as we go forward now that things are seemingly becoming a little bit harder to kind of push the envelope when it is in terms of innovation? Yeah, well, well, there's a few questions in there. So um, I think... Uh, yes, I think that definitely that was uh, an a- appealing factor. Like when you were when you were a medical student, you spend six hours doing a medical ward round, mm. and you just sort of maybe alter their dose of antihypertensives or uh, make sure they've written up for their. <laughs> I mean, slightly flippant, but make sure they're written up for their laxatives when you're on the on the <laughs> on the on the ward round. And they didn't see, and it was all very slow slow burn. Whereas when you when you're doing surgery, there's the, the sort of immediacy to it mm. and um, uh, and almost at the, t- at the end of the procedure, you know, you, you, you've got a pretty good idea whether they're going to do do well or not. Um, I think the creativity more in in orthopedics certainly probably comes into trauma and yeah. fra- fracture fracture fixation because every fracture is obviously different, yeah. and you've got to try and think of. Uh, You've got standard plates, which are contoured to the average shaped bone. But you, you, you've then got to try and make that work for the for the patient in front of you. So yeah, no, that that was definitely definitely an appealing appealing thing. And, and you're always thinking of ideas like we go quite a lot because we have to use quite a lot of implants in yeah. orthopedics. So we get quite of um, uh, often we'll have a, a company rep in in theatre to show the equipment to the scrub nurse and that's and that sort of thing. Uh, and quite often we're having conversations about all. Well, can we just have this Alter modification? That bit, yeah. Just that would just if if that was a slightly different angle, that might that would be easier for me to use. Or it's a bit stiff when we're trying to deploy it. Can we have an easier mechanism? So so the, these conversations are going on Constantly. all that all the time. As I said, I, to me that's the appealing thing about it because if you are a curious person, it opens up lots and lots of opportunities to explore new ideas and as you said even slight alterations and it, it puts on that as it was almost like an engineering kind of framework where you're like i've got a problem to solve and it's a unique problem and i need to find some way of getting to a solution that's going to be useful for this person's outcome um, and it seems like the people who go into surgery are the ones who like those challenges yeah. consistently because i'm sure if you didn't you'd get sick of it really quickly of like, yeah, why doesn't this just work every yeah, single exactly. time <laughs> and it's um it's interesting because some of the uh, I don't know whether it was ever the case in Australia, but certainly a couple of hospitals I worked at in the UK would have their own kind of engineering labs. Mm. Certainly, Stanmore had well, one. And do you want to hear a funny story? <laughs> yeah, go on. We had a surgeon on. He's an older surgeon, and he said early, in the early days of him doing surgery, he and one of his surgeon mates would actually make instruments. Mm. 
because they didn't have the correct instruments to do what they wanted to do. And he goes, we used to just, you know, boil them and then bring them into surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, do you think you get away with that? He said, no, I don't think no, so. No, no way. So, so some of the, um, I guess, creativity has been taken away in the, or the, the immediacy of the creativity has been taken away because you can't just go home and, 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 and rug something up. Yeah. But, uh, um, no, so, so, yeah, the hospitals used to have their own... Uh, Engineer apps, yeah. basically. Yeah. And uh, so there was the... Uh, Stanmore Hip. I did my f- my first year on the training program was a place called Hastings, which is on the south coast of south coast of England, and they ha- and we had the Hastings Hip there, which was the only hip only place they ever used it. It was yeah. sort of because obviously then everything gets taken over by the big companies. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's it's better for consistency of, yes. of development, like manufacturing, yeah, and exactly. all that kind of so, quality. Um, but yeah, so there the, the, the was that side of things. So certainly they would uh, there would be a lot of. Uh, uh, of previous generations of surgeons would be down the down the engineering lab and, mm. and tinkering yeah. with things. Do you, do you is that something that you personally are interested in? Like, do, do you, if are you like speaking to the reps and trying to, do, or are you someone who's these days not necessarily as yeah, involved? I think, in I that? think if you see, I think obviously because there's, I guess, a lot of money in it as well now for the for the companies. They've got their own uh, sort of R and D departments, mm. and they they're kind of fielding ideas or the um, all the time, um, it's it's difficult as a as a single surgeon, I guess, to uh, to uh, come up with the idea. So some of the smaller companies are more open to it because mm. um, yeah, there's payoff for them if they if they get something correct, and also um, I guess there's less hurdles to get to get through yeah. in terms of if yeah. you want to go to one of the big companies in it's the head office structure, sta- yeah, yeah. Of head office in the sta- and yeah, exactly, and yeah. and they'll have their kind of design surgeons in the states, and it's really difficult to break into that mm. sort of mm. that sort of thing. So there's a few little things that we think about, and we we talk to them, and sometimes they pay off, and sometimes they sometimes they don't. You need to create something and patent it, and you'll be set. <laughs> 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 Only when it's other people use it. Yeah, well, that too. <laughs> all right, and typically the last question we ask a lot of our guests, um, and it doesn't have to be related to your profession, but what's something that you are currently exploring or interested in and you're learning about that uh, that is, is getting you excited at the moment? So, yeah, so I got the question sent through, but there was the exercise physiology yeah, yeah, tag, which, uh, which um, so I'm, I'm thinking on the spot here. So the... Um, it could be anything. You know, yeah, yeah, no, personal. so it actually t- does tie into the kind of, because I think we're all, we're all in a kind of pro-inflammatory state, and mm. I think that's got, as well as tendinopathies, it's got problems with Every well, cancer and yeah. everything, basically, yeah. diabetes, everything. So I... Um, uh, something I'm exploring and doing at the moment is um, is uh, cold showers and mm-hmm. cold cold water therapy. I don't know if you've had guests that have done that, mm. done that before, but that's taken. So now I basically cold shower every every morning. It's taken. It's very unpleasant. Yeah, <laughs> it has. It took about ten months probably to get. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, so I started off with a few seconds at the end of the shower, and then you, and you build it up. up, and then now I can just get in the shower. It's not. It's not. There's. There's a lot of. Um, there's a big psychological component to oh, it. Absolutely. So you've, you. I, you have to deep breathe and then um, uh, be in the right mindset to to go in. And unfortunately, where I live, I don't live that that close to the bay. But I'd I'd love to do some cold water mm. swimming as well. So I think the stuff I've been reading about that. There's an anaesthetist who's written a book about it from uh, Brighton in the UK, and it's also quite popular over here. Um, uh, so, because of the anti-inflammatory effects, mm. m- mental health, and um, uh, so that's something I'm pretty interested and in. And also in regulating your autonomic nervous system, you get a massive parasympathetic response, like post. Yeah, post yeah. Post yeah. initially it's sympathetic. Initially it's sympathetic for sure. Yeah, well, that's right. So, because obviously the face is different to the re- rest mm. of the rest of the body, so you can't, you shouldn't plunge your face under. So, so you have to. Uh, you can do your whole body first, and the face has got to come at the end. Otherwise, you get parasympathetic and sympathetic at the same same time, which can, okay. which then can cause problems. So they, they, you should never really dive in. You should get cold, neck to, down, correct, yeah, and then okay. and then before putting your face in, so you get acclimatized at that. In terms of your own personal kind of experience, what have what have you noticed? Have you noticed major changes? Obviously, your cold tolerance has improved clearly. Yeah, sure. But like, uh, have you noticed other beneficial things? Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I think I think I've got more energy, and maybe it's all it's all going to be anecdotal. Yeah, of but, course. But, yeah. Uh, we appreciate that. Def- definitely more energy. Um, generally, pretty pretty happier, and I think more focused as well. Actually, mm. which, which is difficult to attribute that to uh, one, one thing. thing. Yeah, exactly. But it all it all accumulates, I guess. What about heat therapy? Do you do any um, sauna, or anything? sauna or anything like that? Yeah. No, I've never been. Mm. So there's also a lot of really good research yeah. for that as well. Well, they, they sort of work on a similar mechanism. One yeah. creates cold shock proteins, one creates heat shock proteins. and, and Essentially sh- builds up your antioxidant defense system, yeah. essentially, mm. your endogenous secretion of these compounds that essentially balance out all that pro-inflammatory state that we're getting from poor sleep, poor diet, yeah, sure. too many stresses in our life, pollutants. Yeah. Mm. I mean, because I've been doing that with um, intermittent fasting and maybe mm. sort of more ketogenic, Diet, mm-hmm. so w- w- they they probably all play into the effects rather well, than just the they, it's not the mechanism exactly the same, but they're similar kind mm, of absolutely. things that they're trying to attack. Yeah, particularly yeah. ketogenic diets yeah. and um, fasting. Yeah, yeah. and op- upregulating autophagy. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. Alrighty, um, uh, this has been a really enjoyable talk. Thank yeah, you so much indeed. for your time, Richard. Thank you guys. Thanks for the invite. Great, thank you. <laughs>